You can get the new 9800X3 today as reviewed. It's a fantastic CPU, but maybe you're curious, hey, what do I need to cool this guy? So stay tuned, let's break it all down. Welcome to Machines and More. I posted up my launch day review of the 9800X 3D yesterday, and yeah, it's spectacular, right? It's gaming's new king, but you have to cool it. And that's what we'll dive a little deeper into today. So real quick, uh, if you are shopping for the CPU or the cooler that, uh, that's gonna go along with it, please consider supporting the channel by using the product links down below. And that really helps the channel. So um, big thanks for that. And please also make sure you're subscribed if you enjoy this type of content. If you watched my review, I noted that for the heavy multi-core scenarios, the power draw, it's actually quite a bit increased over the 7800X 3D. So it's used, used to be 90 watts or so at most, but because of the repositioned V-cache die, the thermal transfer is better and AMD felt comfortable really lifting those power targets there. It's still not going to draw quite as much as the max for a 120 watt TDP chip which is gonna be 162 watts. But in testing, I routinely saw this one draw down 140 to 150 watts for a heavy multi-core process. And while that's not a huge amount of power, it's not trivial either. And it does warrant at least a quick discussion on what you need to do uh, to cool it, as well as the impact from using too little or too, uh, too marginal a cooler. Um, and I said this in my review yesterday, so this is, is really important. If you're purely gaming with this, which is very possible considering the target market for the 800X 3D chips in the recent years, then it's really not as critical a, a discussion, right? Because for all except uh, one of the most uh, marginal cooling solutions that I'll show you today, those will all let you game without much penalty. So the noise and the cost, that's gonna be your main priority there. So for my uh, performance testing in the review, I used the customized Atmos 360 millimeter AIO uh, from Cooler Master's TD500 Max. So it has a thicker rad, absolutely great unit. And while you totally can, uh, perhaps let's start with uh, cooling you don't need. This is it. Uh, with something like a 360, you will absolutely uh, get the full boost clocks and uh, extremely good temps. Uh, keeping in mind that the TJ Max or the Max operating temp now spec'd by AMD is higher than the 89 degrees previous on the 7800X 3D. So it's 95 degrees now for the 9800X 3D. And the way CPUs work nowadays, it, as provided there is thermal header metal, it'll just try and draw down as much power as possible based on the boost algorithm that's spec'd by the manufacturer, in this case, AMD. And in doing so, it's also gonna try and clock as fast as possible up to the max for the, uh, the max spec there. So what a 360 is gonna get you here is the ability to run your fans at a lower RPM and still get the same performance. And it's also gonna give you room for a less than perfect case or a case airflow setup. And it's also gonna get you the ability to push a heavier PBO setting or manually overclock it. Like for example, I showed in my review, I could get this guy to uh, 5.35, 5.4 gigahertz on all cores. And uh, since with the 9800X3 manual overclocking is unlocked, that's kind of what this is going to enable you to do. So the 360 will give us a good baseline to work off of. Uh, the max boost you're going to see without any PBO adjustments is 5.2 gigahertz max. So this indicates that as long as you're close to that for your all-core clocks and actually for your game clocks, you're going to be pretty similar to that 5.2 gigahertz as well, then that cooling solution is, is good to go. Uh, so what I did to avoid any thermal differences from the quality of the cold plate, the rad and the fans are just to turn off and mask off each section. So I turned off each one of the fans and masked off that section one by one. I did keep the rad fans pegged to the same RPM. So this way we really see what the impact is from having um, each incremental size of radiator. So you can see here, if you go for 240, like for like, you're going to see some elevated temps. They're not exactly low, but they're not going to negatively affect your all core clocks. That's enough headroom for the boost algorithm. And it's not until you go for a 120 that you'll see some lost clock speeds. It's only about 30 megahertz lost here. Do you have very elevated temps though? At this point, you're at the mercy of your ambient temps in your room and your case airflow. With my ATX case setup, these fans are having to be intaking for the front. So this is basically the best airflow setup you can get, but not everyone has that setup. If you can't get that good of a setup, or if you're in a scenario where you're gonna see some interference from an operating GPU, then you you may be in a not so good scenario. So for an AIO, you could theoretically get by with just a 120 if you don't have the space, or if you happen to have one already. Between these three options, the performance is actually pretty similar. There's no real change between 360 and 240, but the temps 
from that 120 or getting to that point where it's a little too close to comfort or you're gonna see consistently loud or elevated fan speeds when the CPU is fully loaded. Um, also the AIO rad and pump block that I'm using to simulate these results are very good and, and almost top in class. So if you're gonna try and get by on a 120, then you absolutely need to get the best unit. But that being said, you really want to give yourself a little headroom. So the 240 is gonna be my recommendation there. Um, AMD's recommendation happens to be a 240 or 280. And while I don't think you need a 280 necessarily, I, I would tend to agree with that general conclusion. And, and to that, I would add a high performance dual tower option, uh, such as Noctua's D15G2 or Thermal Ride's Pure Assassin or, or Phantom Spirit 120. That tier of air cooler will perform similarly to a 240, so that will also be ideal for the 9800X 3D. Uh, there's plenty of great 240s right now. One of my favorites currently is Cooler Master's Atmos 240. It's a very high performance unit, great cold plate, great pump. And another good option if you have the thickness clearance in your case is Arctic's Liquid Freezer 3 240 millimeter. If you want to go with less air cooler than a dual tower though, that's where things might get interesting. So how about a single 120 millimeter tower? So this guy here is Cooler Master's Hyper 2 and 2, uh, relatively affordable and uh, unique in that it has a very high RPM fan. So I'll show you the results at the max 2500 RPM and also at 2000 RPM. Uh, of course, it's very loud at 2500 RPM, actually still pretty loud at 2000 RPM. But other than the high RPM fan here, it's fairly representative of a simple single tower. And uh, this type of cooler is one that you can just about get by with. Uh, similar to a 120 millimeter AO, you're gonna lose a little bit of boost clocks. But one thing you can see here, even at what is already pretty fast 2000 RPM, you are achingly close to throttling. So <laughs> just like with a 120 AO, you probably could get away with it, but you're really not giving yourself or, or giving the CPU much room for any other factors. We're gonna get even smaller now, and we're actually gonna move to the small form factor case in the Terra now, because normally you wouldn't go this small unless you had a case constraint. And what I'll show you is just the results from what is the best cooler in this low profile form factor right now. This is the Noctua L12S by 77. Review this here on the channel. It is on the tall side for what you can fit in this case. So if you happen to be running a bigger GPU on the GPU side, uh, then do take note because this is kind of as good as it gets uh, for oh, top-down coolers. Uh, another thing I'll notice that the beta BIOS for the MSI B650i, it's not quite as aggressive yet as the X870E Crosshair Hero, but it may not really matter because if you take a look here at the temps, it's actually hitting thermal throttle and it finishes the render only drawing down about 117 watts. So it really doesn't matter if it could uh, draw down based on, on the board BIOS. Uh, and I know many of you are going to be forced to go smaller in this case, right? This is the the top. I did a specific comparison for the 7800X 3D and we'd looked at the Thermalrite XP120, ID Cooling IS67, Big Shuriken 3, uh, and the replacement for that is coming soon from Scythe. Uh, but those are all gonna be underperforming this one, right? I don't know how the Big Shuriken is gonna perform, but this is probably as good as it gets. So really take note if you're looking at the 9800X 3D for use in this scenario, if you do wanna do heavier multi-core stuff. Uh, with even the best in this form factor here of the L12S by 77, you're gonna lose about 200 megahertz. It's not tragic necessarily, but you're, you're really not getting all you can get out of this CPU and you're spending a lot on this CPU, right? All right, so should we even go here? This one is the uh, IS30 from ID Cooling. It's tiny. Based on the L12S by 77 results, you probably know this is gonna be more for entertainment value. We know this is not going to work well enough, but let's just see how much performance you lose by getting way too little cooler. So versus the 140 watts that you could draw down with a 240 um, AIO, this guy, the IS30 finishes only drawing down 88 watts. So that's like a TDP, a 65 watt TDP chip. And obviously you've got thermal throttle going on here. It's only clocking at 4.4 gigahertz. So way too little cooler for the CPU. Uh, but you know, interestingly, as I mentioned early on, if you're just gaming, actually most of these can work fine. In fact, the IS30, even though it's not going to get you everything out of the chip, even here with this little guy, it's only gonna lose about 150 megahertz on the boost clock. So, um, and that's because gaming is gonna have cores less than fully loaded usually. You're only gonna see a 60 to 70 watt draw depending on your title, depending on your utilization. And even though the 9800X 3D is not as low powered as the 7800X 3D was for gaming, the good news here is that it's actually still very, very efficient. And even if you have to use a low profile cooler like the L12S by 77, you're mostly gonna be fine for gaming. So 
Yeah, you know, that's good news, right? So yeah, in summary, the 9800 x ready to get all you can out of it, you need a 240 or a dual tower, but for gaming only, you got tons of options, no matter what form factor, cooler, or case uh, you're working with. So I hope that helps. I'm gonna leave links for the coolers I talked about and some other ones to reference down below. Go ahead and check out the link for the 9800 x 3 d 2 Like, subscribe if you loved it. Thanks for watching. Thank you.